So good morning everybody and thank you for joining me on my first lecture I will be having on our chapter 5 which considers light matter interactions as you can see in the table of contents for our course and I really enjoy this chapter 5 because here we now know everything about Maxwell's equations we know how do we form a wave equation based on them and we know how light propagates but in this chapter 5 we are putting our focus more into the question and answering that question of how how did we give rise to this radiation in the beginning in the first place so this is what we will try to tackle in these four next lectures so first i will be speaking about radiation from atoms and molecules so essentially i will be introducing the main things we should know and understand so basically like we have many atoms or electrons and actually it's their states that they, we are interested in about and then I will be speaking about the other implications that we have in, in realistic emitting systems then in chapter 2 I will be speaking about light matter interactions the basic things that can happen so essentially I will be introducing to you a processes of absorption relaxation of an uh, excited state uh, I will be speaking about radiative versus irradiative uh, relaxation processes, spontaneous emission, and I think I will also speak about stimulated emission. And that, of course, is a quite interesting and important process because it provides us a means to make you know, light amplification devices such as lasers and parametric oscillators and amplifiers and so forth. Then in chapter 5.3, I will be speaking about a Lorentz model for an atom and essentially from an electron. And that provides us a mathematical framework that we can use to understand how light is being created in a, in a piece of a material, a piece of a solid. Of course, it's a classical model, so we do not deal much or essentially anything about quantum mechanics of things. But nevertheless, it does provide us a quite good tools to understand how we could calculate if not quantitatively at least quali qualitatively the refractive index profiles of dielectric materials and that is of very much of importance and interest in terms of optics so we're interested in dielectric materials which essentially are materials that light propagates through them quite happily without being absorbed that much or being deflected, reflected out of the on the interfaces of dielectric materials, so that light can actually propagate inside, unlike with metals, and and then we, we even get to understand how come all materials are dispersive in nature, meaning that the refractive index profile depends on the incident wavelength. And for engineers like me and you, or, or future engineers, it's really the dispersion of the refractive index profile that is the key. In many applications so this is really important lecture i will be having later on and then finally in 5.4 i will be speaking about the laser principle so essentially i will be showing to you how we could realize a lasing device and what's a lasing action and what is needed and, and i will be speaking the main things about that so that then we can really understand how we could give rise to light propagating light now that we have the wave equation and we can really understand how it propagates but also the process of how do we generate light is important and like i said chapter five is mainly trying to provide you the very basics to understand those processes we do not put in much uh, of the source terms into the maxwell's equations but rather our treatment will be more more on the kind of uh, macroscopic and general in nature so not that much of math and, and more more of other uh, other bits of knowledge we must know to get forward so basically um, kind of introduction of basic uh, terminology so this is what i will be speaking about in the next four lectures and now that i have given you the introduction into the whole chapter i would like to go and start my actual first lecture so we're interested in in radiation of light and then we're essentially looking how atoms and molecules, the kind of tiny uh, fundamental building blocks of our nature, how those give rise to radiation. 
and we are interested at the optical wavelengths and here it's essentially the dipolar radiation taking place due to the light matter interaction that is of most importance and relevance to us so we're really interested in those kind of very small scale emitters such as atoms and molecules so fluorescent atoms fluorescent molecules quantum dots and, and how they interact with light and since they are tiny with respect to the wavelength, wavelength of light we can pretty much describe their radiation and scattering properties as an electric dipole radiator and, and then we, we know the math already how we could treat these these kind of scattering processes most of the time when we are actually making for example using laser crystals nonlinear crystals or, or other other pieces of matter that give rise to radiation it's a so-called solid matter and in a solid piece of a matter unlike in a gas systems it's really the electronic band structure that dictates the properties of a piece of a solid we do not speak about those in this course but please be warned or, or be, be enthused that in the future we will have follow-up courses really focused just on the on the properties of solid matter so for example our course on solid state physics that you could find enjoyable and actually quite quite elucidating because that really provides us the key to understand what gives rise to the electronic band structure of solids so this guy here this is really the key to understand the properties and then how we could even calculate things based on the electronic band structure so essentially what kind of atoms the matter consists of and how they are arranged and this really dictates the properties but here we do not really like you we are not interested in that kind of physics we are just interested in knowing that okay we have a piece of a solid and it behaves as it behaves so we are nevertheless interested in knowing what are the, the processes that take place in the piece of a solid that then give rise to radiation and, and especially since we're interested at uh, light so at the wavelength ranges of, of 300 to 1 micron uh, roughly so the, the kind of processes that essentially are the most important are the electronic states present in the solid medium so the, you might ask what kind of other processes there are well I could all, all for example say that the phonons could be present and they always are in, in matter so uh, those essentially are more more like a, not not electronic states of electrons, but rather electrons are, are vibrating around, or actually the the atomic lattice of our solid piece of a material is vibrating around, and that gives rise to resonances. But here we are more interested in the kind of electronic state resonances and how how we can excite an electron into an upper state and how it relaxes, and and with with those processes. We, we see that absorption takes place and spontaneous emission takes place. So basically looking at the kind of figures and, and schematics, how we can understand of things. Let's look at the figure in the top right. So here is the kind of basic schematic, what happens. And, and this is really more or less enough for our framework in this course to understand what happens. We do not need to know how we could calculate they, they, these different electronic states and we do not need to worry too much about their properties we just need to know that we have some different states such as the ground state labeled with g and then when the incident frequency of light is right so-called resonance frequency we can actually excite an electron residing at the ground state into this higher state here denoted with a one ket of one and then the electron will be excited when the frequency of light is right electromagnetic radiation and then after a while the electron may may like a relax by just like jumping down to the ground state or it may relax into another state and then it may relax from there and, and depending on the kind of uh, distances in, in terms of energy the y-axis here is basically energy or, or frequency it doesn't really matter it's the same thing in the end <clears throat> then then we may have different kinds of processes taking place at the different wavelengths and, and and this is the kind of picture we're interested in. so something is being excited and and what that something is it's electrons 
and how it's being excited it's via electromagnetic radiation and then something may happen inside the material so some kind of internal processes so that the state of the electron changes into something else and then after a while the electron state may relax and, and this is what we should understand roughly of the kind of overall picture so g the ket of g corresponds to the ground state of the electron and ones and twos the kets of them are the electronic excitation states and, and if you're really interested i recommend you start reading on solid state physics that uh, how you could understand those states but uh, here we do not need to go there and the energy difference here between the two states essentially it's it's directly the energy difference is the, the initial energy sorry the, the state of the excited state so ei so that could be the energy of, of the state one or the state two minus the, the energy of the ground state eg and here we can calculate how we can link this energy difference with with the, the frequency of our incident photon so essentially this new ig is the, the uh, frequency of, of light that is resonant with the system and an edge is the Planck constant and when when incident light has that frequency we can really efficiently excite electrons from the ground state into the excited state and using the reduced Planck constant and the angular frequency please remember like what was the uh, definition for reduced Planck constant it essentially it was Planck constant divided by 2 pi so now we can see how we were able to change the new the frequency into the angular frequency. It's the same equation, so that gives us the difference in energy between the two states. So here, the good piece of terminology to remember is that this omega ig is the resonance frequency between the states, and then this is the, the ener energy of interest. So that the, that is with that we can relate with with absorption and emission of light. So it's not really that the, the, the energy, actual energy of a given state is important in terms of light generation and absorption, no, but it's rather the energy difference because what photons are, essentially there are means to transfer energy from point A to point B or, or receive energy from, from the point A. And the final thing, or final things that I would want to mention here is that the, here what we have in practice in a piece of a practical material is that the, we have electrons there inside the medium and in fact we most of the time also have some kind of ambient temperature so that the matter piece of a matter is not at a cryogenic 3 Kelvin temperatures but rather for example it could be at the room temperature or even higher so what that means is that in essence we actually start having a highly dynamic process or, or a highly dynamic system another, another word describing dynamics usually is the statistics or, or statistics, statistical so that they one could also say that these processes are statistical in nature essentially like uh, more on these will be described in our course for example statistical physics so phys 222 and also in the course of solid state matter and also in the course of, of structure oh sorry solid state physics and, and structure of matter and uh, and how come okay, we can link dynamic dynamics and uh, statistical systems together and then process it together is that the in a real system in fact we do not have just a single electron residing in these states but rather we have a, a like a zillion number of electrons present there so even a single cubic centimeter uh, of a solid piece of a matter has electrons of the order of Avogadro's number so 10 to the power of 23 and then when this kind of system with a huge number of electrons inside is on some kind of ambient uh, temperature like it means that the, the, the electrons can jump around here and there in the electron state manifold sorry, or just energy state manifolds due to the fact that they have some thermal energy associated with them and, and this is what gives rise to the kind of dynamic nature of the process and since the, the processes are, are dynamic in nature then the, what kind of mathematical tools we should use to understand them 
then we must take use of statistical physics and statistical mechanics and statistical mathematics to understand that they, they, these, how these processes on average seem to look like. So they are highly stochastic in nature. <clears throat> so it's a dynamic system. And what happens if you're familiar with the thermodynamics? We know that the total energy of the system tends to minimize itself, and then the entropy tends to maximize itself. Those so this would be a one kind of major concerning principle, governing principle, that tells us how the system behaves. And a second thing that we should remember here is that the most of the time, well, to be pedantic about it, always. We are dealing with a non-zero temperature of the system. So even with the, the temperatures approaching zero kelvins, like we can never reach that zero kelvin ideal temperature. So in principle, always we, we have some kind of thermal energy that uh, is, is present in the electrons. And, and this causes its own effects into the dynamics of the system. So plugging in some numbers, like uh, at the room temperature, 300 kelvins, the KPD value, so this is the amount of thermal energy that is associated with each electron on average. KB is the Boltzmann constant and T is the temperature. That gives us an order of magnitude of 26 milli electron volts. So what that means, you may not have tools to understand this, that they, in principle, every electron has that kind of energy that can readily, it can absorb that amount of electrons. When we are dealing with electronic states, the energy difference here is of the order of electron volts. So this, this kind of thermal energy does not do much here, but especially when we're looking at the electron state and its nearby vicinity. So essentially the kind of uh, vibrational and rotational uh, states nearby those manifolds, then this 26 milli electron volts already starts to be quite a lot of energy so that the electrons can start jumping around into the higher states due to a fact that we, we are having this system at room temperature. And, and this is what gives rise to kind of a little bit more of flavor of complexity into the dynamics of things, because at room temperature, we should also take into account this fact that the thermal energy of the system may, may do its own, own thing for the fluctuations of the states. But, but more on those things later on, in terms of this course, you do not really need to worry about too much of things. Um, of course, if you're interested in spectroscopy of molecules, then, then this might be a good thing for you to remember that they, they, it's the temperature of the system that also affects things. Because if you really want to measure, for example, vibrational spectra of some molecules, there it's the room temperature the ambient temperature that matters also. And then the final things, okay, we have many electrons, like I already mentioned, so that we must be treating the system as a statistical problem. And, and this is why we, we take use of the tools from statistical physics. So excited states, so that will be the case of I, they tend to relax to the lower energy states. So that's of course based on the energy minimization principle. And here, the kind of lifetimes tau of these different states that kind of essentially dictate the dynamics of these processes. In, in normal um, atomic systems, we are speaking of lifetimes of the order of tens of nanoseconds. So that, that roughly gives you an understanding of, of, of the kind of time range of the dynamics in, in case of um, atomic emitters and then fluorescent molecules, quantum dots and so forth. So things, the kind of what happens here, like a, usually we're not speaking of, of femtosecond time scales, but rather of sometime something that is of, of, of short, uh, sorry, uh, lower, slower pace. So that that's what happens. So this was my first lecture. Like I hope this was a good interlude, interlude to the other other lectures that I will be speaking about, and I hoped you you got the main points that they, we have a emitter system and, and you know the basic things that we must understand to understand how, how these systems can A, absorb light and then B, scatter and emit light. So I thank you for your time and please stay put for the next lecture. I will be then speaking more about the, the basic light-matter interactions. So what can happen 
in terms of this, this energy scale here. Thank you and bye-bye.